Hi, my name is Andrew Shaw, and I'm here to speak to you today about several lessons I've learned as a student scientist. So I want to begin with what science is about. And more than anything else, science is about discovery, searching for answers to important questions and trying to solve puzzles about everything from the interaction of quarks and the Big Bang to the Human Genome Project and combating infectious diseases. Now, my scientific career started at five years old with a pile of owl pellets and dead frogs in a wonderful Montessori school run by a headmistress who loved science. And I soon graduated to the fungus among us, growing mold in lunchboxes inverted to examine its growth on bread. But as I moved through education, I started reading more about the world's great scientists, and I decided it would be fun and also informative to recreate their experiments. Even young children, as I once was, clearly, can learn, that's right, can learn and test Newton's laws. But it isn't just the remarkable achievements of Galileo, Newton, Einstein, and Darwin that are so compelling. What's really amazing is how creative and original was the thinking that led to their discoveries. And really, the body of knowledge that is science research is no more than one enormous dynamic thought process added to and revised by researchers over the centuries. It's always changing, that's true, and even great minds like the Greek philosopher Aristotle can be proven wrong, and you don't even need complex experiments to do it. Galileo was able to with just the Tower of Pisa and two balls of different weights. Now, in the same way, Einstein's work on the theory of special relativity and also his role in encouraging nuclear research made an impact on me, especially in an age of terrorism. So I did a scientific investigation of the effects of a terrorist nuclear attack on New York City, the quintessential high-cost, low-probability event. I developed a mathematical model of a 10 kiloton nuclear detonation, which indicated that more than 1 million people could die on an average workday. But to my surprise, the model also showed that millions more could survive deadly nuclear fallout if they knew what to do in the first 48 hours. This led me to a policy recommendation for resurrecting and modernizing low-cost civil defense measures, like duck and cover, for instance, which were clearly futile during the Cold War, but could be effective against a single nuclear detonation. These results and their obvious implications made me a lot more interested in disaster preparedness. If we can understand how the mechanisms of a catastrophe unfold, I believe that we can try to prevent worst case models from becoming reality. Now that nuclear project underscored two enduring lessons for me. And the first is that in science, experimental stumbling blocks are common and may require detours. For instance, we don't actually have nuclear detonations anymore, so we simulate or mathematically model them instead. And second, Surprising or intriguing results should encourage you to pursue new, but also related, lines of inquiry. So Galileo, Newton, and Einstein are all giants whose shoulders anyone would be proud to stand on. But the scientist who's had the greatest impact on my scientific research so far, at least, is Charles Darwin. I first read On the Origin of Species when I was 10 and instantly became an ardent admirer of Darwin. He not only introduced me to the natural world in a serious way, but also showed the far-reaching significance of evolution through natural selection and survival of the fittest. Now, many young scientists are naturalists, although few are lucky enough to travel the globe on a ship like the Beagle, hopefully you saw it, it just moved off the screen, and eventually end up on the Galapagos. And this underscores another lesson. You know, scientific discovery can often be serendip serendipitous, excuse me, and up to chance. So try and be a little ingenious in your methodologies and try to make your own good luck, remembering from Virgil, of course, that fortune favors the brave. So when I was young, my parents always took me on their research travels abroad, which usually meant some pretty interesting side trips and also opportunities for science learning. So once we, rather, we went rather far off the beaten path to the Pastoina Caves in Slovenia, where we could see a marvelous specimen, the Ulm, Proteus anguinus, or the human fish, which adapted to a life of complete darkness in massive subterranean lakes by relying solely on its senses of smell and hearing. It can live for up to 70 years. But Darwin's ideas about evolution don't just work they also matter. Because the viruses and bacteria, which look so pretty in the color photos on the screen, I know, they are very beautiful, are living, not breathing of course, but still out to get us. How can these microbes kill us? Well, it's simple. Natural selection says that if we can't outcompete the microorganisms with whatever means necessary, we won't be fit and we won't survive. So this fundamental Darwinian insight of survival of the fittest and the challenge for humans to do just that, survive, is what has motivated much of my own current research, leading to three additional lessons. The first being, you always want to select a few really important questions to work on that you're passionate about. And then, 
Read everything you can find that's written on those questions. Science is, as I've mentioned, a dynamic, progressive discipline, and it's essential to know not only what other scientists have found, but also what they've ruled out in order to avoid reinventing the wheel. And finally, acquire the research skills and appropriate methods, both quantitative and qualitative, necessary to conduct your research. Now, with my own questions in hand about the increasing lethality of bacteria and the spread of viruses, I started learning the necessary skills right here at Hunter College High School. Fortunate enough to work under the guidance of Mr. Randolph and the gifted science faculty in the Hunter Research Lab, I, was I examined different treatments of E. coli on produce in one of my first experiments, which you can see here, uh, leading to a city science fair paper and award, and given its practical significance, an interview in popular science. A subsequent project at Harvard University, where I was mentored by the brilliant Hunter alum, Professor Adam Cohen, investigated enzyme dynamics in gels. Now, I work day and night in the lab, but I also learned something, and that is tenacity is a virtue because significant results usually take more than one summer or however long you would spend at the lab over one summer to obtain. Luckily, I have another major project, one that I've had the fortune to work on both individually and with a fellow student researcher that's also worth pursuing. Now, my research team is interested in investigating uh, outbreaks of pandemic and seasonal influenza, and we're especially focused on the puzzle of why otherwise healthy people, aged around 20 to 40, die young after contracting certain strains of the flu. Now, what we'd expect is usually that high mortality rates occur in very young children and the elderly. During seasonal years, this is what you see. Now, one possible explanation for the phenomenon seems to correlate with recent discoveries about the 1918 Spanish influenza virus, namely that it combined with bacteriological co-infections to produce significantly higher mortality rates in the middle age group. Now, you can see the idea of this unexplained MAGM, or middle age group mortality, really well in this graph. What we have here is the horizontal sum of mortality from 1911 to 1917 on this orange graph. And you can see there's no bump in the middle. But the blue graph, which we call a W-shaped curve, and you can see why, has this unexplained middle age group 1918 mortality. So that's what we're interested in. So after applying some statistical analysis and doing mathematical modeling, we observed two big things. First, that during both pandemic and epidemic years, there was evidence of a statistical relationship in an extended middle age group ranging from teens to 45 years of age. Furthermore, if we incorporated bacteria into a multivariate, many variable model describing influenza mortality, it made it more accurate than if we just relied on viral factors alone. So who should care? And really, it's you because I think that most of the people in this audience really don't have the tool that they need to combat these bacterial co-infections. PPSV23, which is to date uh, the most effective vaccine at combating these bacteria, uh, is usually allocated to the very young and the very old, those outer regions of the age spectrum. That makes sense, because those are usually the people who are most susceptible. But I think we all need to think about or discourse on a question, which is what happens if we do have another bad seasonal outbreak or even, God forbid, another pandemic? What happens if the results of this research are correct and, and the bacteria are really the key to the middle age group mortality? What then? So before I wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about TEDx Hunter CCS's motto, uh, which is also Hunter's motto, Mihi Kura Futuri. And I think that from my presentation, you can generally see that I've tried to make this my guiding principle. And Hunter really is a great place to start on a journey of scientific discovery at any age. But I also want to add a maximum of my own which I think, again, springs naturally from all the ideas I've been talking about, which is the care of the future really belongs to science. Uh, now to wrap up, here's a quick summary of the seven essential lessons I've learned as a young scientist. So first, you always want to find questions that you care about, but also that you love, that you really want to work on. And second, embrace surprising results, because many doors, many opportunities can be opened even by findings you don't expect. And third of all, discovery is like generally serendipitous, Opportunities open up, so you have to take advantage of those and be a little ingenious in your methodologies. Remember, fortes fortuna adiuat, fortune favors the brave. When you actually have a topic, read everything that you can find on it. Familiarize yourself with the foundation you're building on. And then get the skills you need to do the work you want. And finally, creativity and persistence really can shift even the largest of obstacles. Taking detours, using new methods, these are all ways that you can get around things that science puts in your path. But you also need to know when you've finally exhausted all avenues of attack and need to move on. Now, unfortunately, it's time for me to move on as well. Thank you. <laughs> so one quick question. What, was, what did you learn in terms of the scientific approach from being in Adam's lab this summer? 
Well, uh, I was in Adam's lab actually in the summer of 2010. Oh, sorry, two summers. That's okay. Two summers but, um, ago now. Oh, so sorry. I have to say, first of all, that Professor Adam Cohen is really amazing, not only in the way that he approaches problems, but also in the way that he runs his lab. And I think really the most important thing I learned from him is uh, after working in his lab, I started becoming more involved with teamwork, you know, leading a group uh, to conduct some of the research that I mentioned. And I think I learned a lot from him, not only on how to manage a team, but how to interact with different people on your team, you know, play to their different strengths, talk through different problems with them. And I really think that this is just something he's so amazing at teaching, uh, not just the research that he actually does. So.